Welcome everybody to a new hot and cold list. We are a week after San Diego Comic Con, so you know the hot list is going to be full of great information. We have great cold lists as well, but before we get into it, I have my co-host with me, Jack DeMeo, aka Mr. Bolo. What's going on, bud? Nothing much, Brian. What's going on with you, man? Very excited to be here with another hot and cold show. And, uh, man, you hit the nail on the head because Marvel certainly dropped Thor's hammer on the speculation community, dropping so many announcements that this hot and cold list is absolutely on fire. All right, as always, we'll bring up the contributors that make up the hot and cold list. A lot of comicbookinvest.com authors. We do have one person on the DL list again this week, and that is Ben Stein, right, Jack? Yeah, we're still without a hot 10 writer, Ben Stein. Hoping to get him back uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, definitely uh, nursing a little spec injury, but uh, we'll be bringing him back soon. But don't worry, because we do have another guest pick, and the guest pick this week is going to come from Simple Man's family member, right? Not only a family member, but a Simple Man's Comics Patreon member. He's going to be providing us with a guest hot pick and a guest cold pick tonight. So we will have that coming up. Jack, anything else you want to say before we get into this list tonight? Well, I just want to say, yeah, I'm excited to have uh, our Simpleman's Comics family, our Patreon member, join uh, the show this week. I think uh, Sarah was one of the highlights of the show last week. A lot of people were really excited to see her pop up. So, you know, we're giving you a little heads up. It's not, not so much a hijack going on situation going on right now, but definitely excited to have uh, our Patreon family join us on the channel. So with that being said, we're going to roll right into the hot list this week with Run the Table author Clint Jocelyn. Good afternoon, CBSI Nation. This is Clint Jocelyn coming in with my hot pick of the week this week. And my hot pick of the week this week is Batman Beyond number one, non-free comic book day edition. This book has seen some lows and now is starting to see some upticks. A couple of reasons for that. Number one, the first appearance of Terry McGinnis is always going to be a hot book because it opens up a different universe and lore that we've seen before. Any kind of different Batman universe always is going to be appealing. Number two, there's a lot of copies of the free comic book day ones that do have some value, yes, but certainly not the ones that don't. And those books are valuable now and in the foreseeable future. Terry McGinnis is a great character that has a rabid fan base that you see podcasts on, you've seen cartoons on. But I really think at some point you may even see a extended TV or movie universe for this character. So this is a hot book that is only going to continue to get hotter, but right now is in the shadows of all the other MCU books. So... I would look to see if you're looking to purchase this book. I'd jump on it now. Batman Beyond number one. It's a great book that's still affordable for those. And I really believe it's going to be a true gem down the road. So there we have it, Jack. Clint Jossens talking Batman Beyond. You've seen this book, especially that number one issue, go up and down. There's a lot of great books in this series. I don't think he gets the attention that is due. But I've enjoyed reading a lot of the latest run. But he's talking specifically Batman Beyond number one. What do you think about this title? Well, I definitely love Batman Beyond number one, and I definitely think um, I agree that Terry McGinnis is kind of an undervalued yet cult popular character in the DC universe. And I do agree with what Clint said about, um, you know, Terry McGinnis and Batman Beyond being kind of primed for some form of media um, kind of uh, adaptation, especially when, you know, you look at what the CW is doing with Batgirl. We know that, you know, DC doesn't want to give away such a large property like Batman on a TV show, but they may be willing to play ball with something like Batman Beyond. Um, I also look at what Marvel is doing with the multiverse and what the success they've had with Spider Gwen and Miles Morales and giving these alternate forms of a character. And you got to look at Sean Murphy's got a, a real um, kind of momentum going with his uh, Batman the White Knight series. And I think that DC may be trying to get in on some of that kind of multiverse, different different versions of a character um, to kind of like play on to different crowds and different communities. I also think we've talked about aging up characters because, you know, Terry McGinnis exists in a world where Bruce Wayne is also still in that world for a period of time. I think it, that opens the door for a lot of different adaptations. But here on the Hot and Cold List, we don't like to stay specific to one issue. So I will agree with what Brian said. Um, this latest run through Rebirth has been amazing. Some of the variants have been just just standout. Um, some Ben Oliver really just killers. And they're really flying under the radar. So while that first appearance is absolutely hot and keeps going up, I think if you're really trying to speculate on Batman Beyond, there's a lot of options out there even beyond the first appearance, that are really underserved in the market. 
And then, like we talked about, like Clint talked about, there's a lot of possibility in the future for this character. And there's definitely a lot of the speculation attention right now is heading towards the MCU, which is making for available plays in a lot of other areas. Right. So I do want to thank Clint for that pick. And make sure you check out his Run the Table articles on comicbookinvest.com. Fantastic articles. And love the CBSI hat. If you guys want to get one of those hats, check out cbsiswag.com. So thank you for that pick, Clint. And we're going to roll right on to the next pick, which comes from indie spotlight writer Andy Tomlin. That's right, fellas. He's back in the lineup, and he's got a great hot pick for you, and it's coming up right now. Hey, what's up, everybody? Uh, Andy here with uh, CBSI Indie Spotlight Series. Uh, what's hot this week? I'm going to have to go with Canto. Um, Canto as a series is is selling and, and, and picking up some, some steam again here uh, with issue two on the horizon coming out next week. Uh, over the last week, we, we are averaging about 10 sales a day on Canto. The regular cover is going from 10 to $15 still in that range. The one in 10 variant is going well over ratio at $50 still. Uh, there is a San Diego Comic-Con variant. Very hard to find, only one listing on eBay right now, and that's for $199. I don't recommend paying that. Uh, there is also some heat coming on the issue two. We are seeing sales of issue two now up around $8 for the regular cover, and the incentive is creeping up now over $30. So this is one that's not going away uh, anytime soon, folks. So make sure and try and lock your copies down of uh, issue two coming up. Uh, this is going to be a hot one, I think, for a little while. But this week for sure, Canto heating back up. Don't miss out. So there we have it, Jack. We got Andy Tomlin talking Canto. Now, this is one, this book is kind of weird because right when it seemed like it was starting to kind of dip a little bit, San Diego Comic Con came. And next thing you know, it's got renewed energy. Issue number two was supposed to drop today. I didn't see it at the bookstores. But love the story. We had David Boo and Drew Zucker, the creators, on this channel. Right, we had a great interview with them, so we all fell in love with this title. So you don't have to sell it to us. So we always think it's a good title, but just like Andy says, it's rising again. What do you think about this, Jack? Yeah, I mean, you're you're exactly right. Well, obviously, the three of us. Um, and first off, let me say, happy to have Andy back. Welcome back. Um, the the hobby and industry has definitely missed you in your absence. Um, so we're definitely happy to have him back. And he's coming back with some heat because he's bringing up something that obviously the three of us, uh, we are big fans of, big advocates of. And, you know, it, it's been really indicative of the market, the way that this book has gone, because the only reason I think we saw some dips with Canto for a period of time were really just due to speculator attention going other places. And as that number two issue starts to draw closer, we start to see that heat building back up. Another important thing to remember is these FOC dates. Canto number two, you had to put that order in before Canto number one had dropped. And speculators hadn't fully jumped on board kind of what we knew was going to happen until the number one issue hit. Copies were selling out everywhere. Even damaged copies were selling out everywhere for prices that were four or five times cover price for books that needed a, then a press on top of it. Um, so... Canto has been a story that really is driven on reader buzz. Uh, it, you know, it's it's a story that, like we talk about, and I feel like we've talked about this several times on the channel, you know, it connects with so many different audiences. And that was something that Brian and my hypothesis kind of on 2019 in comics is that reader buzz is coming back. There's more and more new comic book readers, and they're kind of driving the hobby on speculation because the books are selling out that, speculators who are using these kind of age old ways of predicting which books are going to be popular. Um, they're missing some of these books that just end up becoming real reader buzz books. And we've tried to identify those books. And Canto was a book that we identified from the get go. And then you brought up uh, David Boer and Drew Zucker couldn't be two nicer guys. And we've said that every time we've talked about this book about the way that they promote themselves. I have no doubt that their success with the San Diego comic-con variant has a lot to do with them. The fact that they were available in San Diego, they were promoting their book, they were doing signings. I have no doubt that other members of the community who had the opportunity to meet them felt the same way after meeting them that we did. Um, in, in, granted, we met via you know the internet and um, you know technology and everything, but 
These guys are great. I'm very happy to see their success. Issue number two is great looking cover on cover A, great looking cover on that incentive. Um, I think we may see retailers catch up to this book around issue three or four, but nonetheless, I think number two, Andy hit, hit the nail on the head, is going to continue to um, do some numbers. Now, the incentive might not do what number one did, but at $30, you're already talking about three times ratio, which at that price a retailer can pay for their entire run of the 10 books with the sale of a ratio, allowing them to order as many books as they want and have these books. It doesn't look like that's what happened. And it looks like we're going to have a shortfall in the market again. Um, but Andy's right. There's still the demand there. Um, there's a premium paid for those uh, mint cover A's from number one because of the, you know, kind of widespread diamond damage on that book. Um, but also another thing to bring up is that second print for cover A, that cover art switch was amazing on, on the Indie Spotlight series show. Uh, that was something that we brought up to those guys. We said, hey, if you guys do late printings, make sure you switch that cover art up. Not only have they switched the cover art up, they brought absolute heat with their cover art changes. And I have no doubt uh, that they're going to end up with m late printings, third print, second print for number two. Um, it, the demand is there for this series. And the interesting thing will be, because this is a series built on reader buzz, as this story progresses and reefs get more and more into this story, will more and more people jump on board? Um, so these prices may, may be only on the beginning stages of getting to where they're eventually going to go. And, you know, we make the joke, you know, hashtag Canto movie, but... I definitely think that ultimately that's where this play may end up. And as you know, we live in the age of adaptation, like we talk about here on the Civil Economics YouTube channel. And as soon as that adaptation announcement gets made, books tend to explode. We saw that this weekend with San Diego Comic-Con. And I have no doubt at some point these guys will get their time. Right. What did David Biller kept seeing, saying during the interview? Seven seasons in a movie? <laughs> Seven seasons in a movie. Absolutely. So, again, thank you, Andy, for that pick. And we're going to roll right on into the next hot pick this week. And it comes from Mel V from the Mighty Mel V YouTube channel. Mighty Mel V here with your hot and cold pick for this week. Uh, the hot pick at the SDCC. I'm going to go with uh, Jane Foster books, uh, one of 10, and third number one has taken off. There are plenty of other books that you need to be in the search for, uh, like the one of 50 for the Thor, number one that came out in 2014, I believe. Also, uh, what if number 10 appearance has taken off crazy? So, that's some kind of thought she'll make. I think she'll make a good thought. We'll see how it goes. But again, hot. Jane Foster. So, Jack, Mel's talking about Jane Foster Thor. That's like one of the hottest things in comics right now. But I also think he got in trouble with his bosses, like calling him up saying, you better be selling, you better be closing. And that's why that's probably why his office is like that vacant, right? So he could just dip if he has to. Gotta go! Eject. <laughs> but Jane Foster, Thor, I don't know if there's anything hotter right now with comic books because that seems to be every other post on Facebook, every other post on Instagram, people posting what they think is the, J the Jane Foster book to get, whether it's, you know, Volume 4, Volume 5, Thor, or uh, God of Thunder, number, what, 25? I mean, there's – every people will think – what if number 10, all those books are hot, all those books are selling. I think the market is still deciding exactly what books are the ones to get. But what do you think about this pick, Jack? Well, you're exactly right about everything selling, and the market is still kind of determining where they want to go with it. And that's why my suggestion to speculators is just enjoy it. If you've got these books, sell them. Now, if you're a long-term believer in this, absolutely, you may want to hold one back. If you're a collector, that's a different story. But if you're a speculator who's been sitting on these Thor number ones for a number of years, like I have, I've got, I've got a small stack of them that I've been sitting on. They've been a, almost a tough move at $10 to $15 of late. And now you have this opportunity to sell for $45, $50, or more. Now is the time to make that move. Um, and again, we're talking Thor 1 from the 2014 series. But there's so many more books that Thor number 8 where – you know, it's finally revealed that Jane Foster is Thor. Um, the another one that I, I found the other day that I think is very interesting that I see trends going up in sales is Mighty Thor number one, the front pie variant, where it's a J. Scott Campbell cover, and you get to see Thor actually handing the uh, the hammer Molnair over to uh, Jane Foster. That's got kind of a 
kind of a cool moment that may we may see play out in the MCU. Um, also, like you mentioned, God of Thunder 25, where that's well, Marvel's already kind of named that the first appearance of Jane Foster as Thor. Um, but, you know, it's like a couple weeks ago when we were talking on the Bolo show about um, War of Realms Omega and Jane Foster's first appearance as Valkyrie. Both Brian and I weren't really high, per se, on that appearance. Because we felt like she had already played several different characters. There's already a prominent Valkyrie in the movies. And I mentioned that, you know, Thor, I thought, was a better play. And had no idea that that this quickly and in this manner we were going to go here. Um, That announcement's been met with kind of um, mixed reactions. Some people love it. Some people hate it. I talked on the Bolo show that my daughter dressed up as Thor for Halloween uh, one year and, you know, Uh, She was very excited when I told her the news, and my youngest now wants to wear her old costume this year because now she's excited about the upcoming uh, Thor movie. So, you know, I just think it's an announcement that either way, whether you love it or hate it, it's polarizing. We've we've used that word a lot on this channel, but polarizing sells comics. Um, it, It gets people talking, and I think out of all of the Hall H announcements... Um, Jane Foster as Thor is the one that has been able to kind of make a lot of money for a lot of people. Yeah, we're going to talk about some other books and some other announcements that made big money. But this was a play that you could have had cheap. I mean, I've seen some of the incentives from that 2004 Thor run in five dollar variant boxes over the last, you know, couple of years. I'm sure you have too, Brian, especially as, you know, Jane Foster left the mantle of Thor back to um, you know, Thor himself. And, you know, as that has happened and the heat has dried up from these books, um, these books have been readily available. So I think the le- one lesson to be learned is we as speculators have to be prepared for that San Diego Comic-Con weekend because when these announcements drop, these books, and overnight, they completely change the landscape of value in these books. And I don't think there's any book that's a better example of that than Thor number one. Uh, but also, like you said, what if what if was pop, what if ten was popular before, um, but it had kind of dropped down to that twelve to fifteen dollar range. But you know, at this point, that that book has a rocket ship on it. So regardless of what book the market ends up naming the first appearance, I think the reality is they all have value. I think that any variant cover that features Jane Foster as Thor, whether we're talking Mighty Thor, when we're talking the original two thousand and fourteen Thor run. Issue two, three, four, doesn't matter. I think they're all going to be in demand. And I think the time to strike on that is right now um, because we're going to hit that low period between the announcement that we just got and the movie release. And we're going to see some of these prices come back down to earth at some point. But right now, if you're a speculator, now is the time to dig in your own boxes and dig in those boxes at your LCS because you're going to find some gems that you can make some good money on right now. So I think this is a great pick from Mel B. Right. Yeah. For those saying, which you'll see all the time, sell or hold, sell or hold, sell. And because strike while the iron's hot, you're going to make money. I mean, it's not worth holding on to. Okay. Sell or hold. What's the level of risk you want to take? I can almost guarantee you'll make more money now than if you wait for a trailer. But there's also more details you need to know, right? Right. She signed on for to play Jane Foster again as Thor. What's her MCU contract like? Is she one and done? Is she going to freaking die in this movie? You know, now she's Valkyrie in the comic books. What's going to go on with that? I mean, is it going to shift again? Who knows? But now I don't think it's going to be a hotter time than right now. Yeah, I mean, I can almost see her because they just created her as Valkyrie in the comics. Maybe she transitions into Valkyrie at some point in the MCU. But, you know, we really truly don't know. And it's like you said, you know, you can play the guessing game if you want. But I know right now that you can make 10 times cover price on that book. And that's not something you should be shying away from. And we're going to roll right into the next hot pick from the mass speculator himself and true first author, Topher S. Welcome back, speculators! After the whirlwind that was SDCC this past weekend, I wonder if you guys got a hangover too. Did you contract the FOMO? Well, wait it out long enough to come to your senses. I'm sure the firefighters of Hot and Cold will give you the comic lowdown, but I can't help but get wrapped up in hot people. That's right, every week it seems like it's another hot person on my list. After that Marvel panel, collectors are probably up to their waist in Eternals. These are probably books you already should own. 
but I'm going in heavy on one. Ajax, that's right. Why? This is why. So this week, the casting for Eternals is hot. Specifically, Salma Hayek. See you next week. So there we have it, Jack. Topher's bringing up Eternals again. We had another announcement at San Diego Comic-Con. But some people were upset that there wasn't any Cersei news coming out of it. But Eternals, shoot, Eternals has been kind of hot since Guardians of the Galaxy came up, pretty much. Started talking about Celestials there. These books kind of got hot then. And then, of course, once they mentioned the movie, a lot of people thought, oh, this is new news. Well, it's not really new news. And then now we're hot again, fresh after San Diego Comic-Con. So what do you think about this pick? Well, I love it. I've been long speculating on Eternals. Um, I, I made a purchase of several copies of Eternals number one a couple of years back from CBSI owner Ben C. So, you know, he's he's uh, been sour about that one for a couple of years. But, I, you know, as soon as the the celestial information kind of dropped in Guardians of the Galaxy, I, like many people, started looking ahead, which, by the way, I know I'm getting off topic here. It's something that you should be doing now. Because these books are already hot. So if you're looking to buy, you should be looking at what's next. But Eternals, while we knew it was coming, um, you know, now it's official. And it gives it that, you know, that stamp approval from Marvel. Yes, I agree about Cersei. I think that's what most people were anticipating was a major Cersei uh, news, whether it was casting or, you know, idea of what her role in this is going to be. I can't imagine they're going to do this without Cersei. So... I still think there's something left to come. We have to remember we still have uh, D D23, the uh, Disney conference coming up. Um, there's still going to be news. And I, the reason why I really like Eternal Spec is the movie is one of the next couple movies coming. So we're going to see it next year. So they're going to get into production on that one pretty quickly. Right, the casting on this Eternals movie is phenomenal. From Brian Tyree from FX's Atlanta um, to Kamal Ninjani, uh, whose star is absolutely rising from The Big Sick to uh, HBO Silicon Valley um, to huge names like Topher mentioned, Selma Hayek, and of course Angelina Jolie. And we've got Richard Madden playing the uh, lead role of Icarus. Now, well, like I said, I really expect to hear Cersei news. A lot of people were expecting that Angelina Jolie would be Cersei. And I think one of the most undercover plays is Eternals number five. This was a kind of afterthought issue. It was one that a lot of people were picking up because it featured three first appearances. But the first appearance of Thena, having turned out to be Angelina Jolie, has really sent that book skyrocketing. It's now a $50, $60 book, and it was like a $10 to $15 book just a week ago. So that's something to keep an eye on. With these teen books, we saw this with Guardians of the Galaxy. So many different books come into play. Guardians of the Galaxy was one of the most profitable movies for speculators for that reason, and I think that gets overlooked. Um, a lot of people who are newer to the hobby and to the speculation community they may remember when Guardians first got announced, and they may look at a book like Hulk 271 as a, this huge key, but uh, just a few years ago, we were finding those books in $5 boxes, dollar boxes. Um, we were pulling out those you know, magazine first appearances out of you know, old, dusty boxes under tables. So that's why I kind of like this this spec because I think there's going to be so many different books that come into play that people are going to be grabbing books for. And now's your opportunity if you really want to bet on Cersei to grab those Eternals number threes because I was looking at pricing just yesterday and it's really interesting to see that like Eternals number three hasn't shown any bumps since the move, movie announcement and it's now going for less than Eternals number five. And all it would take would be proper casting of Cersei. And I think that's going to come, whether it comes and she's a major player in the movie or whether it's a tease for the next movie. Again, Marvel doesn't make one-off movies. So if they're doing Eternals, they're getting into Eternals for the long haul. And there's no way they're going to do that without Cersei. Um, so I'm excited for this. I'm excited for more cosmic uh, stories. I think this is a incredibly diverse cast and it fits because the team of the Eternals is an incredibly diverse team. And um, I think casting is indicative of what's happening now in the MCU. Uh, at, it, you know, 10 years ago, you had actor, they were struggling to get actors to take these parts. Robert Downey Jr., this was a rehab assignment for him. You know, he was trying to rehabilitate that career. Um, and now you've got all of these Academy Award winners, Academy Award nominees, and Emmy winners wanting to get involved in 
the MCU. And I think that is absolutely a testament to what Kevin Feige has been able to do. So, you know, if there's any doubt in your mind, put your trust in Feige. He's delivered home run after home run. And I expect Eternals to be no different. Right. So there we have that was Topher's hot pick, Eternals. Definitely hot right now. I would be shocked if we don't get a Eternals new Eternal series coming soon at some point. I mean, because these characters aren't currently being used by the Marvel publishing side. And um, they tend to like to capitalize on upcoming movies. So I would expect to see an Eter- a new Eternal series being solicited soon. Right, because I always want that movie audience to be able to go into a comic book store and, and buy Correct. the book of what they just saw. Right, and that, that Jack Kirby run is drying up and going up, so that's not realistic. And uh, I don't think the True Believers issues are enough to compel readers and collectors. Right. And with that being said, we're going to roll right into the next hot pick this week, and that is from the Reading Pile author, Dan Piercy. Hey, you guys. This is Dan Piercy of dpiercyscomics.com, home of the Reading Pile on CBSI. My hot pick this week shouldn't be that big of a surprise to anyone paying attention. It's... Captain Marvel books. This number eight that came out with the first appearance of Star had a ton of covers that all sold really well. This copy in my hand is actually going out the door after I filmed this. There was this regular cover. There was a secret variant for this. There was the Carnage cover. There was the Virgin variant Carnage cover. And there was the 1 in 25. All of these sold really well. And here's a surprise. This Art Germ Walmart variant, I was going to make this a cold pick, but then I checked sales from the quarter all over the board, ranging from $5 to $25, CGC copies, 9.6s and 9.8s moving too. So there's still a lot of demand for this, making Captain Marvel my hot pick for this week. I'll see ya! So it should also come as no surprise that Dan is a big Asuka fan for... for the. Is a big Oscar fan for wrestling, right, Jack? Oh yeah, yeah. Dan is a big, big Oscar fan, and uh, Kyrie Sane and any of those Japanese female wrestlers coming into WWE, he's always advocating them. Yeah, all, all the the Kabuki masks back in the background, but he's talking Captain Marvel last week. That seemed like the title to get. Everyone was hunting any cover from Captain Marvel eight. What surprised me in his pick though is I had no idea that there's Walmart art germ variants. We're going back up again. I know they're kind of hot when they first came out, kind of fizzled off. But like he said, you check sales, and it does seem there's an uptick in those sales. But what do you think about this pick, Jack? Well, I'll tell you why I think that is. And that is because there has been a lot of talk that this character, Star, who first appeared in issue number eight, actually may have cameoed in issue number one out of costume. Now, we don't have any real official confirmation of that, but there's a character that appears in issue number one who looks a lot like Star, and there's a lot of discussion that that groundwork could have been laid in issue one, and I think that that has also started to propel some of those issue number one variants. So we're seeing that residual heat spreading across the Captain Marvel series. Also, we just talked about Hall H and San Diego Comic-Con. It was announced, albeit brief, that Captain Marvel 2 is coming. And just that announcement alone is enough to pique speculator interest. We talked about this with the creation of Star, that there isn't a lot of kind of arch nemesis type characters for Captain Marvel. Now, I wouldn't expect to see Star in Captain Marvel 2. But it gives real credence to the ability to speculate on these characters coming from this universe. Uh, I think Captain Marvel is here to stay. I think we're going to see a few more movie releases and I think a few more appearance beyond her own movies. So I think... Captain Marvel's a lot of kind of room to grow with that character. Uh, and, you know, yeah, I think time will tell, but Captain Marvel number eight seems to have really grabbed speculators' attention. Um, I think a lot of it is going to be kind of indicative of what issue number nine does and issue number 10. Uh, does it continue to maintain that interest? Um, some, I, I'm excited to see issue 10 when we switch to that Mark Brooks cover art what that does because that you know just the cover art appeal seems to grab people so much um and marvel's put a lot of marketing into those issues so we'll see what happens i think it's going to keep this book hot for some period of time so be on the lookout for that one check out issue number nine and number ten if for no other reason to read and let you know whether or not you need to be speculating on issue number eight personally for me it could be freaking 
Hot as the Sun. <laughs> it's just one of those titles that I don't care too much about. But um, for those that are in the got skin in the game and are, are flipping them, kudos to them. But this is usually one title that I just pass over. And I wasn't a big fan of the movie. Like I didn't. I, hate it. I enjoyed the movie. I didn't hate the movie, but I wasn't. I enjoyed the soundtrack. <laughs> I mean, anything with Nirvana in it. I didn't come out of that like super psyched about it. I I was entertained. I was enjoyed. I'm not gonna say I ha hated the movie, but to me it's at Iron Man two level. But yeah, well, there's such a high bar at this point in the MCU, right? So many of these releases have been so just fabulous that it gets to a point where you know you, you can like a movie and not love it but it almost comes off like you're downing it and i don't think that's what you're doing here um but another thing i talk about on a regular basis is we kind of advocate to speculators don't chase books yeah. um so this this was a good play if you were able to grab this on real estate um for me to advocate to somebody yeah go go pay the current market value for this book I, I can't do that at this point. That's why I say issue number nine and number 10 are going to be very important to see what happens within the market and, wh and where people kind of move with it. Um, but yeah, I'm kind of with you on this one where it's like, and I'll, and I'll be fully honest. I, this one slipped past my radar. I didn't grab more than just a couple copies at my LCS. I, I'm not going to chase this one. If I sit this one out, it won't be the first, it won't be the last. But that's my speculation strategy. If I can't get in on that initial ground floor price, chasing up the ladder will burn you more than it will benefit you. And plus, we all know the best character named Star was in the movie Lost Boys, not Captain Marvel. <laughs> but thanks a lot for that pick, Dan. And we're going to move into the next hot pick this week. And it comes from Covertoons author Mike Morello. Hey everybody, Mike Morello from CBSI's Cover Tunes with my hot pick for the week. And this week I'm going with WandaVision. Um, it's obviously not really a secret pick. I think everyone sees this on the radar along with all the other announcements from Hall H at San Diego Comic-Con last weekend. Um, but this one intrigues me. This is uh, going to be an interesting take on these characters. Interesting to have them have a show together. It'll be interesting to see how they bring Vision back. Um, and obviously while the two big keys, X-Men 4, First Scarlet Witch, and Avengers 57, First Vision, are obviously hot, um, they've sort of always been hot, and they've kind of always been keys, and I really don't see them being affected much by a good or a bad television show. Um, they will go up. I think they're going to see um, even more gains than they already have over the last week. But I'm also uh, very interested in sort of the B-level keys. Uh, things like the first Monica Rambeau. Um, she's slated to appear in the uh, show either as Photon or as um, Captain Marvel or whatever they decide to use her as. Um, but she has been um, talked about. Um, there's also a lot of talk surrounding how they're going to bring Vision back. And maybe it is White Vision. This is the first appearance of that. This has gone from a dollar bin book to um, a 10 or $20 book over the last week. As a result, again, pure speculation, but it has gotten hot. Um, other books to keep in mind may be um, Avengers 134 and 135, which are both partial origins of Vision, um, and books like this, which did see some heat after Endgame because of the Avengers Assemble line that's in it. Um, but either way, this book can still be gotten relatively inexpensively, um, and it is the first time that Scarlet Witch joins the Avengers. So this may be a big one, too. Um, it's, it's seeing heat, but it's hard to tell if that heat is still due to leftover Endgame heat because of the Avengers Assemble line or whether or not it's hot because it is the first time. Time Scarlet Witch joins the team. Either way, all of the sort of surrounding books are doing well. Um, you know, variants for Scarlet Witch, the really, really good ones like the Hughes and the Art Adams and some of the Granovs, those are selling really well because they're gorgeous. Um, and so you can't really go wrong with some of the better ones there as well. So pretty, really anything that sort of surrounds Scarlet Witch and Vision at the moment, maybe even, although it hasn't started to see heat yet, maybe even that Vision and the Scarlet Witch um, series from 1985, if they choose to go with that story arc, that may see some heat soon. For now, it's not doing anything. Um, but it may soon. So that's my hot pick for the week, WandaVision. Thanks, everybody. Have a good one. So, Jack, there we have Mike's pick. He's talking about WandaVision. This is going to be the show on Disney+. Plus. It's going to be really... I'm going to be curious to see how well spec works with Disney+. Plus Because normally TV spec kind of catches a little spike and then dies off real quick. But he mentions a lot of great titles. Some of those, like they've gotten hot before. We mentioned the Avengers with um, Scarlet Witch. That one got hot right before. What was it? Civil was it Civil War, and then 
No, Ultron. Yeah, that one. Ultron. That the Avengers book, he got hot. It got hot right before Avengers Ultron, when with Scarlet Witch coming on board. But he has a lot of great other covers. What do you think about this pick, Jack? Well, I love the pick, and I think you actually led me right into kind of what I was thinking is looking at this as TV spec. I actually think that that is one of the kind of missed things that happened in Hall H. I don't look at these Disney Plus shows as TV shows. Now I know that that's the format that they're going to be. But look at the timeline. Um, they are firmly in phase four. The thing about TV spec, and for any of you guys out there who have only been doing this for a couple of years or you know, just recently got back into it, and I know that so many of our Simpleman's Comics family are that way, and we love you guys. Um, just to give you kind of like a, a history on TV spec, when TV show, these comic book TV shows first started popping up, I'm talking Arrow, and then followed by the Flash. Well, even just the Agents of Shield with Death. Lock. Agents of Shield, right? We we all made a ton of money early on, um, and then we got used to that. Every character that appeared, we all started grabbing those first appearances, expecting to see those returns, and we didn't. And we ended up getting held holding so many books of characters that only appeared in one episode or. It was this villain of the week, and he was there, and then he went away, and you don't know when he's going to come back. And, um, you know, a lot of there was a lot of fluidity, and eventually what ended up happening was people got turned off to it altogether. But here's the reality of it. You don't have to watch Arrow to then watch Justice League. Now, I don't know why you'd want to watch Justice League, but nonetheless, the two aren't connected. That is not the case here. You absolutely will have to watch WandaVision or you are going to miss pieces going into the next Marvel movie. And let's be honest, who amongst us is missing Marvel movies? We're not missing any of these movies. doesn't matter if it's not your favorite. Like Brian mentioned Captain Marvel not being his favorite. He didn't not watch it. He absolutely watched it. And I bought um, it on 4K digital afterwards. That's there you go. I'll still watch it. Because and it's it's part of a larger story. Essentially, all of these Marvel movies tell one story, and what they have done, and what and what I maybe I didn't realize, and I I don't know how, how if you guys realized it, um, but they have woven these TV shows completely into the movie slate. So things that happen in one are going to affect what happens in the other, and it is going to make those TV shows required viewing. So. I look at the spec of Captain America and Bucky, WandaVision, Loki, completely differently now. Now I'm looking at them and saying, okay, they go from kind of a cool idea, because I like TV show format. I like getting to sit down and um, you know digest the content. That way you get more rather than two hours. You're going to get like eight, ten hours. Um, but at the same point, there's going to be so much story told that will then play out later. You're going to have to watch it. I think that they're going to do extremely well. And another key is that it's, it's the major actors. So instead of, you know, getting different actors to portray characters the way DC did with Grant Gustafson playing Flash on the TV show, but then not playing him in the movie, which didn't really go over extremely well. You know, you're going to get Elizabeth Olsen and Paul Bettany right back in their roles as Vision and Scarlet Witch. Now, as far as the spec is concerned, the books that uh, Mike shows, they're amazing. The books that he mentions are amazing. Uh, I think the West Coast Avenger book is a good short-term play. That's not one you want to hold on to because you just don't know if he's going to come back just, as the right it's vision. Sweet. It's such a great cover swipe of Avengers 57. It really is an old-school homage because you know that, that was before that doing those covers were real popular. Um, but I know that's out of, say, the budget of a lot of our speculators um, who watch the channel. So... I think one thing to keep an eye out for is some of those Vision and Scarlet Witch miniseries. There was two miniseries that were done um, for Vision and Scarlet Witch back in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, they've been dollar bin fodder for a long time. But I really think that this show, because it's, yes, Vision and Scarlet Witch have been in movies, but because this will focus on them, I think that they are going to become more important and more visible characters with the kind of average um, comic movie and TV show watcher. And I think there's a good chance you're going to be able to see some gains there. Again, I'm not advocating you pay high prices, but I see these books constantly in dollar bins. And at this point, it's gone from something that I'm going to pass over 
to something that I'll readily grab because for four dollars to put a one through four set together, that's something that I think you have a good chance of making a return on investment on come time to make for the show to come out. And worst case scenario, you're you're minorly invested in it. Um, another thing is he brought up variants, and there's a lot of like high dollar Scarlet Witch variants. But there's also some modern low dollar stuff that features both of them. And one that comes to mind is that um, variant that just came out a couple weeks ago with Mark Brooks that featured the two of them uh, for the Marvel's 25th variant. Absolutely outstanding. I know Unknown also did a Virgin cover, but even that trade dress cover is just, it's, it's stunning. And we talked about that when that book came out about how gorgeous that cover art was. And that's something that I think could end up getting some real attention come time for this show to release. And then he brought up Monica Rambeau, who got announced to be in the show, but has kind of fallen under the radar a bit. And, you know, I think this WandaVision series has gotten less attention than some of the other Hall H announcements, but that allows for buying opportunities. You're seeing some of the other things like Eternals, um, you know, Jang Chai books, which we don't know a ton of, but... That these books are blowing up and becoming really tough for you to be able to hit your LCS and find. I think there's going to be some meat on the bone with with WandaVision. Uh, I hate that title, but I think there's going to be some Scarlet Witch and some Vision books that you're going to be able to make some money on. So be on the lookout for those inexpensive variants. Be on the lookout for those mini series. Be on the lookout for that West Coast Avengers book. I found that in dollar bins over the years, and I've honestly I bought it purely for what Brian said. It's just a cool cover swipe. So be on the lookout for that stuff. Um, and unlike the some of the other Eternals and Jane Foster that we said, it's a good time to sell right now because of what the prices are going for. Some of those books, it may be a good time to buy and then hold as we get closer to the TV show and people start to realize, like, I need to watch this show. And again, Brian, you're a big Disney guy. Disney Plus, we're talking like five ninety nine a month, aren't we? It's uh, I think they're saying nine, like ten bucks a month, but still okay. worth it. Because they're already, yeah. I think they're saying Endgame's going to be on it. I mean, they're going to actually have like the real movies on it. Right. So you got all the movies. You're going to get all those Disney movies. It's going to be the first place where like Lion King and so on and so forth go. So you know, it, the value is going to be there. It's going to be Netflix's largest competitor. I know a lot of people are championing Amazon, but I really think it's going to be a Netflix versus Disney Plus game. Um, and I think that that announcement and Hall H, like I said, going kind of under the radar that those movies are completely tie in in, in the uh, with the MCU. I think that's going to be big. And then the last thing I'll say is with the name, the title of we talked about it a couple weeks ago with when we talked about Spider-Man Far From Home, the whole multiverse tease. And now we see it in the title of Doctor Strange's movie. Anything can happen. And we know that that directors and movie writers, they don't always follow scripts to the T. I would be on the lookout for Viv Vision, too. I have I wonder if Viv Vision isn't a character, a character who's been so popular in the comics, if they don't find a way to bring her into the movies at some point. And yes, I know that her mother isn't Scarlet Witch, but... Again, they don't have to do it exactly like the comics, and who knows what the future is going to hold. So and that's I mean, another a, a Champions Disney Plus show would be good. Uh, absolutely, I think the Champions, which have been kind of one of the more fun comics that's come out over the last couple of years, I think would make a great Disney Plus show. So, so I think that's a good point. I think keep an eye out for that D twenty three conference. I think there's going to be some more announcements, uh, more details about the announcements that they already made at Hall H at San Diego Comic-Con. So, you know, if, if WandaVision was a announcement that you kind of ignored, I hope that something we said gets your attention on it because I think it's kind of undervalued right now. Right. Yeah, I have a feeling D23 is going to be heavy Disney+. Plus. I'm going to talk more about yep. the launch of it, I'm talking about how they're, you can bundle it with ESPN+, Plus and a bunch of the other ABC, all the other Disney-owned properties. But, yeah, I expect it to be heavy Disney Plus centric, and then especially with those shows and Star Wars. I mean, they, The Mandalorian yeah. from John Favreau, yeah. get, getting into Boba Fett's whole origin. I think there's a lot of money in that with those some of those old Dark Horse releases, Django Fett and stuff. So yeah, definitely, that's going to be another weekend where you want to be ready to move on eBay. Yeah. So, thanks a lot for that hot pick, Mike, and we're gonna roll right into the next hot pick. Nick comes from the usual suspects author on comicbookinvest.com, Peter Renna. 
What's up, everybody? This is Peter Renna, writer of The Usual Suspects, Dollar Bin Digging, and Wizard Rewind for ComicBookInvest.com. And with this weekend's announcement from Marvel at Hall H at uh, San Diego Comic-Con, there is a plethora of things to choose from of what's hot, as they dumped a dozen announcements on us for shows and movies. But the one I'm going to focus in on is uh, Blade. Uh, no one really saw that coming. I think the coolest thing about it is that Marshall Ali actually approached Marvel about the role, which, so that gives me all the confidence in the world that uh, he's a great actor. I could care less if they uh, forget what happened in the Netflix shows that he's cotton mouth. I'm looking forward to this. And uh, these books have been moving a lot anyway on their own with a lot of speculation that we might see something from Blade. But just this weekend alone, uh, we've seen 32 sales since the announcement. And it's not just Tomb of Dracula 10. That's the book I was referring to that it sold. It's also Tomb of Dracula 13, which is Blade's origins also moving a little bit. But really the big mover is that that number 10, and again, like I said, 32 sales just in the first two days since announcement. And uh, if you look hard enough, I wonder if we're going to see, there's one CGC 9.9 .9 out there that sold way back in 20, 2005 for $4,400. God only knows what that would go for if it came back to market today. But uh, that would be my pick for what's hot this week, Blade and Tomb of Dracula. So Jack, Peter brings up another great San Diego Comic-Con announcement, and that is the return of Blade. Couldn't ask for a perfect casting, I think. Plus, people have been wanting Blade for a while. We've seen him come back in some of the Avengers books lately. And he's got the Blade vs. Wolverine, or, or the Blade and Wolverine book that's out right now. But, we're getting Blade back. Another movie. And, as Shane Griffin, known as DC Deadman fan, he brought up a great comment on my Weekly Picks video. We, he hopes Wesley Snipes makes a cameo. And I couldn't agree more with that. I'd love to see Wesley Snipes do a cameo in this upcoming movie. But Blade is back. Movie coming up. What are your thoughts? Well, I agree. I would love to see Wesley Snipes cast in some sort of role. But I am so glad we can finally stop talking about Wesley Snipes reprising the role of Blade. The guy's in like his mid-50s. And can you possibly do better than Mahershala Ali? Talking about a two-time Grant oh Grammy, two-time Oscar winner. The guy's so talented he probably could win a Grammy. But and now we're getting reports that he actually reached out to Kevin Feige for an in for an interview to sit down and talk. And Kevin Feige said, when a two-time Oscar winner hits you up, you sit down. And he said, as soon as he sat down, the first thing he said was, I want to be Blade. And that's how this whole, whole thing came to be. So I like the idea of an actor that is so invested in playing this character. And an actor that literally could not be hotter right now. He could play anything he wants. But he wanted to be Blade. So I, this is a movie I'm interested in. I'll be the first to admit that I didn't love the original Blade movies. They weren't really my thing growing up. Although as a wrestling fan, I did love the Hunter Hearst Helmsley Triple H appearance. Um, I... He went from that to almost being Thor at one point. So, you know, people don't realize that, but go back and watch that. What's that, uh, Blade 2? But, yeah, so I think that the big news come out of Hall H with Blade and the Doctor Strange movie is we've seen these genre changes in some of these movies. We got some comedy movies with Ant-Man and with Thor uh, Ragnarok, and they played really well. And now we're going to see horror. And we've talked about horror on this channel so much. Horror is hot right now. We've had pre-code horror. We've talked horror modern books in general. Horror has been featured on this hot and cold show. And it's kind of a horror renaissance going on right now. When I was a kid, horror movies were all about slasher. Jumping out, ha, surprised you. And now horror is a whole different thing. These dark-themed movies, whether they're dealing with the occult or monsters, they it's like they've been elevated. It's no longer B-movies, and now they're getting the scale attention. Whether it's movies that wouldn't necessarily be considered in the horror genre, like A Quiet Place or Bird Box, um, Us, uh, you know, um, just so many movies coming out that are just really doing extremely well. I am excited to see the MCU delve into this. And I think that Blade is so the perfect character to do that. Now, obviously, Tomb of Dracula 10 is a monster. I, it's kind of like when we talked about with WandaVision. I know that that may be out of a lot of your price ranges. And if you hadn't picked it up by now, it, it certainly may be now because that book is booming. But there are some other issues that I think will get attention. And we talked, you know, 
I know Peter mentioned, and you know, from the origin to the uh, first appearance of Dracula to um, issue, I think it's nineteen, where the villain comes in. Um, these are issues that are going to pop. But also, I would keep an eye on, and I'm going to go back to the dollar box. You know, like that Marvel Max Blade Number One series. And there's just so few Blade books out there on the market that I think anything Blade is going to get attention. And I know that some OG speculators will say, well, Blade, there's already been Blade. But Brian and I see this on a regular basis, being with the channel and with comicbookinvest.com. So many people in this hobby are new. They have only come into this hobby in the last few years, which is why you see these price spikes. Because I don't care what anybody tells you, this industry, it's booming. And there's more and more people coming into it. And as they come in, this is the first time they're getting really exposed to Blade. Um, you know, they may have seen the movies as a child, but that was different. That funded the MCU. Those movies are important. But this is going to be a full-on MCU Blade with all that comes with that. Um, could we see other characters interact with Blade? I expect we will. Will we see Blade show up in an Avengers movie at some point? I expect we will. And this is going to do something to the Blade books that we haven't seen done yet. Um, and then he brought up, you talk about the Wolverine uh, variant that just came out, with the Del Auto variant. I think that's a book, while it's depressed a little bit down to about $60, I think that's a book that's going to have some long-term value. Uh, there's My entire reason for picking that book and talking about that book with the Bolo Show was how few Blade variants exist on the market. And you know that still stands to be true. And just like what we talked about with Eternals, I fully expect Marvel to make some announcement and solicitation soon of a new Blade series because they're going to want to get the publishing side on board with the movie side. But Blade is something that people have been clamoring for for a number of years. I think it's going to be excellent. And then, again, to talk about diversity, it's a black superhero character. There aren't a ton of those in the Marvel kind of fan base, or excuse me, the Marvel database. So to be able to go and have this character who will be a you know, major character within the MCU, we've already seen the popularity of Black Panther. I expect the Blade to do kind of similarly and do extremely well. Um, so be on the lookout for those Blade books, uh, you know, especially those kind of low flying under the radar books. And, uh, you know, be on the lookout for future announcements from Marvel because I definitely think there's going to be more coming down the pike. And then the other interesting thing with this casting is Mahersha Ali had previously played Cottonmouth on the uh, Luke Cage TV show. So it'll be real interesting to see for those who have been speculating that those shows may return on Hulu or on the Disney Plus app. I would kind of bet against that now if they're going ahead and recasting characters. Um, you know, that's not something I would expect to see unless they start dealing with the multiverse using that. But um, which is certainly possible. But, you know, that's something to keep in mind as well. There's a lot of people that say if it wasn't for that 1998 Blade movie, you wouldn't have the MCU right now because that was like the first movie that Marvel actually had success on and it was rated R on top of it. Plus, yeah. that opening scene of the first Blade movie, what was it, like the rave that they went to? And then yes. the sprinkler just started freaking sprink blood coming out of it. One of the best opening scenes in a movie. But... <clears throat> Yeah, I've heard it said that that movie literally funded the MCU that we're watching now. They wouldn't have been able to buy back the the movie rights to so many characters that they didn't own at that time. Yeah, because they were they had like a Thor movie that went like straight to video, a Captain America movie, but Thor was one of the ones where they first found success, and I enjoyed that. I enjoyed the first and second one, third movie I wasn't too great on, except for Jessica Biel, but with that being said, that was another great pick from Peter. And we're going to move into, not only is it the final hot pick, but it's the guest hot pick from the Simple Man's Comics Patreon member, Comic Man Andy. Let's see what he's got for us. Mic check, one, two. Hey, comic family, this is Comic Man Andy with the Simple Man Comics Family Patreon group. And I'm coming at you from the Comic Man Andy Comic Cave Comic Command Center. Nailed it. With my hot pick for the week. And it's variants in general. Yeah, variants over here, variants over there. People, we got variants everywhere. And there's most comics nowadays are coming out with some sort of variant. Um, whether it's retail incentive or uh, you name it. Um, hidden variants, um, artist variants, um, other store variants. 
just about everything's got a variant attached to it. So we get to see some amazing art, we get to see some pretty out there art, and we get to see some not so amazing art. But it's all good. It's all hot. We all love it. It's a little something for everybody. So um, just remember to not burn yourself out. Definitely don't burn out your bank account. But the one thing you need to always, always remember is to collect what you love and you'll end up loving what you collect every time. Peace out. Pinkies out. We'll see you around. Oh, we always say buy what you like, right? But he even said it better. Collect what you love. That way you'll love what you collect. But variants, variants, I mean, they're hot right now. They were hot last week. They're hot next week. Variants aren't going anywhere. They seem to always be hot. There's always a hot variant that's out there. But what do you think about this pick, Jack? I love this pick. Um, when I first saw this pick on the list, my reaction to Brian was variants. You know, that's kind of vague. But, you know, when you the more you really think about it, we just talked a minute ago about the industry as a whole. And we get now to look at more of a macro view of the industry rather than a micro view of individual releases or books or titles or characters. And, you know, people have been kind of predicting the downfall of this hobby and they've blamed speculators, they've blamed the publishers. And one of the most popular things that gets pointed at is variants. And I've often said, I don't see variants going anywhere um, anytime soon for one major reason. So many artists and creators are being employed simply by having these variant covers exist. Without these variant covers, if there's only a cover A for each book, a lot of artists would not get work. And we would never have been exposed to so many amazing artists that we all love in the hobby today. Does it sometimes feel like there's too many? Sure. But the key is... You've got to kind of get out of the mindset of buying. Like he's mentioned, buying everything. You can't own everything. You've got to pick and choose what appeals to you. And the great thing about variants is they provide a lot of low print run, high-end collectibles for the people that are really into that. Um, I just talked about, when we're talking WandaVision, about a, like a cheap under-the-radar book uh, by Mark Brooks, which is a book I love, Brian loves. But it wasn't necessarily one that popped in the hobby. But because it appealed to us, it was one that we had our eye on. Um, and it's still one we've got our eye on. And then, you know, you, you talk about if you're a collector of a specific character, it gives you so many different options and things to chase. Um, it, again, as long as you get out of that kind of entitlement feeling of not only do I want to own it all, but I have to own it all, it, it just creates more fun in the hobby. And as a retailer, We've created some retailer exclusives through comicbookinvest.com. And yes, that that market can get messy, but it all depends on the retailer themselves and what their goals and what their aims are. You know, with comicbookinvest.com, we're trying to release rare collectibles that the market wants. And we're trying to shine a light on properties and publishers who are out there doing their thing and who deserve that engine. And we are very proud with all the books that we have released thus far. Um, we haven't taken any shortcuts and it all kind of depends on how you do it. As far as retailer incentives, the LCS is obviously the lifeblood of the hobby and these retailer incentives help them to cut their costs down on the overall books and allow them to order more books. If they did not exist, you would see less cover A's, uh, on the shelf at your local LCS. I still think old school retailers are having a hard time learning how to adjust to that changing market. Um, we talked about it with Canto, where you could literally order as many Canto number twos as you want because a, the average retailer for 10 copies is going to pay $20. And then they could sell the incentive for $30, profit $10. And now you've got all of the cover A's to put on the shelf for cover price. You don't have to hit your, your customer on the head for over cover price pricing like a lot of LCSs try to do with books that are popular. You can put them out there for cover price and you know it's all profit because you already sold those variants. So it's all about learning how to play with this changing landscape of this hobby. Um, it's ever changing and ever growing. I don't think variants are going anywhere. And I love Andy's take on it where it's like if you look at it from the brighter side, it's providing so many great art opportunities, so many, so much exposure to new artists, um, so much fun for different collectors of different characters. And, you know, it's providing literal employment for so many artists out there who don't want to be starving artists. 
and instead want to be well-fed artists and are now getting that opportunity through variants. And every company does them a little different, whether it's Marvel's Retailer Incentive Program, whether it's DC's Cover B Program, um, some of the indies who are going with just Cover Bs, but they're doing B, C, D, and E. You know, everybody does them a little differently. Everybody has their own style. Um, and they have continued, no matter what people do, draw the attention and sometimes the ire of collectors and speculators alike. Right. It's funny you mentioned um, if it weren't for variants, a lot of people wouldn't be aware of their work. And I'd say especially if those variant artists were doing interior pages because a lot of people won't read the interior pages. They just go off the cover. But that, I want to also say thank you to Count and Andy. Really appreciate it. Not only for the pick, but appreciate your support by being a member of the Patreon page. Really appreciate your support, Andy. And a hell of a pick. And that will wrap up our hot list for the week. But we're going to roll right into the cold list right now, starting with Run the Tables author, Clint Jocelyn. Good afternoon, CBSI Nation, coming to you with my cold pick of the week. And my cold pick of the week, wait just a second. Mike Morello, I love you, but close your ears for this one. I'm sorry, buddy. My cold pick of the week this week is Jenny Frizen Wonder Woman variants. Uh, doing some research on those, they are seeing a decrease. I think that you're seeing a lot of different prison work and the eyes are kind of off that ball right now. But I do believe this is like the Adam Hughes Catwoman run or some other various runs that are going to be worth big dividends down the road. But right now, besides a few issues, you can really get these at cover and that's a perfect time to buy them. Nothing wrong with buying at cover prices. So, you know, Jenny Prison is still hot, but these books I think are just not right now doing as well there's a lot of different reasons for that eyes on the mcu eyes on different dc books wonder woman i think is kind of in the after aftermarket right now just because so many other characters in the forefront so jenny prison books are now a good time to pick up complete your runs like dan Piercy likes to say complete your runs get them done get them stacked and racked for later on because these books will show you a big roi down the road so my cold pick this week is only because I think that eyes are on other prizes right now, but Wonder Woman, Jenny Frizens. Sorry, Mike. Jenny Frizen, Wonder Woman variants. I agree. They, But one thing I want to say is I don't think they were ever like super. They never really took off. They've, they've all garnered attention from the comic book collecting community, but they are one of those covers that at some point you almost say, hey, are these undervalued because they're so gorgeous and a lot of times I don't see my comic book store keeping them in stock. They're selling them, but you don't see that huge spike on the secondary market. But I think Clint brings up a good point also with the Adam Hughes comparison where these might be sought after later when they're stashed away in people's collections and people can't find them as easy. I'll tell you what, that number 70 cover from hers, that blue cover, is one of my favorite covers of all time. I pick that up no matter how. I'm glad it's cheap because I pick it up every time I find it. But... What do you think about this pick, Jack? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, you and I are big advocates of the DC Cover B program, but I, I think what he's talking about with these Frizen Wonder Woman variants, I, you can almost bring up half or more of the series that are going on from DC right now, where you see so much amazing cover art from these Cover Bs that aren't popping on the secondary market. The importance of this Wonder Woman run is, it's what really exposed so many people to Jenny Frizen. Jenny Frizen is somebody we've talked about on the channel as kind of like a B-level player on the secondary market who's becoming an A-level player. I think the argument could be made that she's an A-level player now. And it, all you have to do is look at that Age of Conan release that dropped today. Uh, the, the Queen of... this connecting variant was gorgeous as well. Absolutely. Um, it's getting to a point where when she releases books now, it gets the speculator community attention. Her name is kind of ringing out with uh, speculators. And I think that... That is largely due to this Wonder Woman run. Now, you and I have been advocates of the value of these DC cover bees as long-term holds. And I think the comparison that he made to, to Adam Hughes' run is, is spot on. Because I see the same things that you're seeing, Brian. When I head to the LCS, I don't see these books like in mass on the shelf. I think that they are ordered pretty solidly from LCSs because those are the covers that people want. Um, but I think even like the readers are grabbing those covers because that's what they, you know, the cover's so gorgeous. So they're grabbing that over the cover A. 
I think a lot of people are buying them and stashing them in their collections. And then I think a lot of people are just sleeping on these cover bees. And I think it'll be very interesting to see when we get the next Wonder Woman movie. And, you know, as we go down the pike with the DC uh, extended uh, film universe, which there's been a lot of rumors of J.J. Abrams coming to the helm of. And I think that could be exactly what DC and Warner Brothers needs. I really think that these books are going to get their day in the sun. Now, I know Brian and I have been talking about that. All of 2019 on this channel, we've been saying, you know, we know these books don't hold huge secondary market value. They, I wouldn't even say huge. They hold very little. I mean, very I'll, little. I'll straight up say, I mean, what, what's what been hot, I mean, within the past six months, DC-wise, right. I'm talking regular cover A, cover B titles. I mean, maybe even longer than six months, but there's nothing been super... Like the way you see these Marvel books take off, but a lot of those well, are incentive variants. But we always advocate also that we say we think these are long term holds or will be good as sets later on. I'm in those covers for the longer haul. I'm not ready for like the quick buck. Plus, I only buy what I like. So whether I sell them off or not, I'm happy to have my collection. Yeah, I can't turn them away every every time a new one gets released. And one of my favorites, and I've talked about it for a couple months now, is the one that got released today, that uh, Wonder Woman 75 cardstock variant yeah. for the villain, uh, the year of the villain, Cheetah. that Cheetah cover. Um, there's so few Cheetah variants out there on the market, and I, I, it was only a matter of time before Jenny Frizen dropped a real classic. And I think that this one in that portrait style, excuse me, in that portrait style is an absolute winner. Um, it's one that I think as Wonder Woman 84 comes out, I have high hopes for Kristen Wiig as Cheater, as Cheater, as Cheetah. <laughs> I have high hopes for Kristen Wiig as Cheetah. Um, it's one that I think that a lot of people will kind of look back on. Again, more of a long-term hold. Um, Dan Piercy from The Reading Pile, who's a, a contributor on this show, he talks often about selling books and sets. We just talked about that a week ago. And I think that that may be the play at some point with these Wonder Woman books. But, you know, you look at the, the Adam Hughes books that we mentioned and that Peter mentioned. It took almost, you know, seven, eight years after those books came out before they really garnered secondary market attention. Speculators today don't have the patience for that. They're not looking to buy something that maybe, you know, five to seven years down the road will show them the kind of returns that they're making. And the reason is because there's so many books coming out, like you mentioned, so many Marvel books and incentives where these kinds of percentage returns can be made quickly. It's a dangerous game. Now may be the time to grab these DC cover bees because they are so inexpensive. And Brian and I talk about this on the channel. The reason why they're good plays is because you're talking three and four dollars a book. Um, if they pop at all, you can't beat that buy-in. And I, Brian, I don't know about you, but when I ever I'm looking at dollar sales and two dollar sales i see these dc cover bees listed there one of the books that you and i were, were big fans of was that uh perio red hood and the outlaws book and i just saw that on a two dollar sale on tfaw i saw a batgirl middleton variant on uh, for a dollar from tfaw on their recent sale so there's so many of these books where they're getting overlooked in the hobby and they can be had cheap and I think the absolute antithesis of this is the Wonder Woman run. I think that is probably the most classic cover B variant run that has been done within the Rebirth line. And Frizen has absolutely killed these variants. And I think it's made her a star. And I think that as her star continues to rise, she will always be associated with this run. And this is going to be the run that people are going to want to go back and grab. So... You know, whether or not you've been on board with these DC cover bees, I think that the Frizen run is going to be one to grab when you can see it cheap. And I'm going to tell you, you can find them on eBay because they haven't really popped on the secondary market. But go to your LCS. You're, you're going to have a hard time finding some of those older Frizen cover bees for, for cover price. They're just not there because they're sitting in people's collections. So there we have a great pick from Clint Jocelyn. We're going to run right into the next cool pick from the mass speculator, Topher S. You know what's cold this week? Baron Zemo, specifically Captain America 275. With a killer Zet cover and one of the most insanely cool costumes in comics, 
You would think that video of the actor putting on the mask at Comic-Con would have sent this book to the same place Lady Thor went. So for cold pick this week is Baron Zemo. They announced the actors reprising the role of Baron Zemo again, but it doesn't seem to have moved the needle. What do you think about this, Jack? But yeah, um, you know, I think there were so many announcements coming out of Hall H that it, it's kind of forced speculators to pick and choose where their attention is. And, you know, um, Jane Foster Thor is one, like I said, that was attainable. You could get those books. You could flip those books. So that got a lot of people's attention. A lot of people had already been putting their money into Eternals. So that got a lot of people's attention. Blade seemed out of nowhere. So that got people's attention. Um, but I still think there's a lot of books that didn't get that attention that probably deserve to from, you know, kind of that low key drop of Fantastic Four and Mutants are coming. Um, and definitely a lot of first appearances in there that haven't really seen any spikes due to anything announced in Hall H that will to the Baron Zemo announcement. So, you know, now, again, the beauty of the cold list is it creates buying opportunities. It, it really showcases them. Just because something is cold, it just you know doesn't mean that it's not going to get hot later. I think one thing also is I think a lot of people are felt felt like they're burned from the Civil War when he appeared first time. There wasn't there was all this huge speculation about this great villain, but it turned out to kind of be meh. What do you think? Well, yeah, and we didn't get Baron Zemo in his like true comic book form, uh, you know, full mask and everything. But it, it does appear like that's where we're headed in the future. I think there's a good chance he could show up in Captain America and Falcon. And again, that plays into what I'm saying, where I the TV shows coming to the Disney Plus got overlooked in all of the speculation discussion because they got kind of lumped into TV show spec. And I don't think that that is fair, a uh, fair assessment of the importance of these shows. It's not, you know, I love my CW DC shows, but I don't think it's the same thing because it, they're all going to tie in. So, um, that's something to keep an eye out for. And whenever we figure out where Zemo is landing, I have no doubt that Baron Zemo will kind of get his day in the sun again and will probably wind up on this hot list at some point. But, you know, if if you're out there and you're looking for where do I take my profits that I'm making off of Thor number one or God of Thunder 25 or where do I take my Eternals profits, a good place to put them may just be Captain America 275 because the prices haven't really spiked. And you can get in now, and you know he's coming. And if we're and it is Captain America and Falcon, that's one of the first releases coming in 2020. That's so we're gonna see that one sooner rather than later. So you're not gonna have your money tied up for too too long. So I think we'll all agree for the for right now, Baron Zemo's cold, and we're gonna move right into the next cold pick. Comes from any spotlight writer, Andy Tomberlin. Hey, what's up, CBS on Nation? Andy here, uh, Indie Spotlight series. What's cold this week? Not really this week, but kind of in general right now, these Savage Shores auctions. If you can find the right auction, you can find a heck of a deal right now. You're seeing uh, the the homage for Tomb of Dracula number one uh, right now go for right around $100, whereas two months ago, this was a $200 book. Uh, and I think it's just from people not paying attention people throwing auctions up, uh, expecting to get these big dollar amounts, and when you don't have the people watching, it's, it's just not gonna happen. So now is the time when you need to get in there and, and see what you can find on these type of deals. Uh, also, the cover A is going for 10 to $15, whereas two months ago it was going for 30 to 40. Uh, like I say, buy it now listings are, are still up there, but if you catch these auctions right, it, there's definitely a lot of room in here and, uh, and and some opportunities to make some money down the road because if you've read this series, you know it's not going away. Uh, it's a matter of time before this series gets optioned and hopefully makes it makes it somewhere, you know, so that's the hope. Uh, but pay attention. These Savage Shores auctions right now are definitely falling off and uh, it's something that if you're aware of, you can you can make some gains on. Before we talk about his pick, I'll tell oh, you yes. That. I'll tell you what's cold in my house right now. It's cold all the time. Is that stupid, ugly T-shirt you're wearing, Andy? What's that, Clemson? Clemson's cold. Clemson's always cold. You know who's hot? Florida State Seminoles. They're always hot. They're just rope doping right now in that conference. They're letting Clemson get a little bit of fame for a couple years, and then they're going to come back, and they're just going to take it away from you all. So I hope you're happy, Andy. Take that Clemson shirt and burn it. But thank you. We're not even going to talk about your pick now. I'm sick of it. I'm sick of it, Andy. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, I thought, I thought we banned him from wearing Clemson shirts on the channel. Yeah, I, hey, I'm, y'all. Clemson. <laughs> I'm currently red hot in my South Carolina Gamecock basketball shorts right now. So, you know, that's my that's our in-state rival, although we haven't been much of a rival on the football field in the last few years. But, yeah, I, I, I don't know. That Clemson shirt just distracted me so much. I don't even know what he said. Yeah. He, I think, yeah, you're fined. We're fining you for that. <laughs> Expect a fine in the mail. But these Savage Shores, we all, Andy, we love you, even though you're a Clemson fan. But yeah. these Savage Shores, we have seen a, a, a downtick in some of these. I still stand by. I still love the story. I mean, he brought up a lot of good points that this is a great buying opportunity, which we say a lot on here for cold picks. But no denying it. They've taken a little bit of dip. But what do you think? Yeah, it's just the buying cycle to me. Um, you see this with independent comics, especially – there's always that flavor of the month right now. Everybody's talking about Reaver or this book or that book. And when that happens, some of these books that a couple months ago were like the hottest thing on the market, they're not talked about as much. And a lot of it has to do with the people behind the scenes trying to work those Hollywood angles. So that's definitely something that he, I know he mentioned that I, I think has a good chance. Once, once that gets announced, we'll see those spikes come back up with these Savage Shores. I have no doubt in that. Um, another thing he mentioned was auction versus buy it now. And that gives a great opportunity to talk about. That's a sh- buying strategy for you folks out there. Um, you know, auctions are great. They help turn cash for the seller. But absolutely, when you're auctioning off an item that isn't in, say, like the the current lexicon of what speculators are talking about, you, you can see those depressed values. So yeah, that book should be a solid $150 to $200 book, no doubt. I'm talking about the second print Tomb of Dracula homage, but uh, yeah, I have no doubt that you can catch one on the low. And the same goes for whether it's you know cover A of the first print, um, you know, or runs of the series, uh, similar to what Dan Pierce talks about selling sets. If you can catch some of those auctions where everybody on eBay is running to those Hall H announcement books you may be able to buy some of these sets and some of these books under market value. So always be on the lookout for those auctions. You Oftentimes, unless you're talking about the hottest books on the market, you can get those books under market value. And they're great to buy and then relist and resell at those higher prices as long as you can be patient. You have a lot of opportunity to buy that book for 100 bucks, immediately relist it for 200 bucks, and just sit on it and wait. And all it takes is an announcement, and boom, you flip that book instantly. So a lot of buying opportunity, as always, with the cold list. But I think Andy also brought up a great point talking about auctions because it allows us to really talk about what I like to talk about on the channel, which is more of that buying and selling strategy, which is the difference between being a book picker and a true reseller, is being able to add that strategy element. I'll say when it comes to this book, I'm kind of a little bit of – I'll admit it, I'm a little bit of a hypocrite. Because there's a lot of books where I'm like, man, I can't believe going, people go out and buy all these covers for the, like, the same issue, same number one issue. But I've turned around and done that with these Savage Shores. I'll, every time they put out a new cover, I'm like, oh, that looks so cool, and I end up buying it. So I'll admit it. I've been a hypocrite, but I love this book. So whether it's up or down, great story. Ram V, uh, was it Samit Kumar? I probably just yeah. butchered that name. Art, fantastic. And... Love Adrian and Damian Wassel. We, we interviewed them. Great group of guys, founders of Vault Comics. Their cousin Nathan Gooden does a lot of the uh, Vault Vintage swipes. Same with, uh, was it Tim Daniel? Yeah, Tim Daniel oversees that program. And I, I think Ram V is a star in the making and hobby. I really, I really think that he has a knack for what people want to see out of a, a current independent comic series. Yeah, and he's wrote a couple Catwoman issues, some of those, some of those Gap yep. issues recently. But uh, It's only a matter of time before somebody in the big two picks him up. Yep. So kudos. Thank you, Andy. And burn your shirt. But... <laughs> Next pick, we're going to end the cold list, just like we ended the hot list, with Patreon member Comic Man Andy and his cold pick. Oh, I'm still here. They haven't deleted me yet. All right. So I'm here with my cold pick. My cold pick's so cold, not even Han Solo's Tauntaun's going to save you. And that's the Punisher. 
Yes, sir, the Punisher. First appearance, sure. Doing great. Always going to do good. Mega key. Everybody's got to have it. Everything else, undervalued in my opinion. Ice cold. Keep them coming. I'll buy them all day long. Peace out. Pinky's out. Let's go somewhere warm. Beloved character and Punisher, right, Jack? Oh, absolutely. I mean, couldn't ask for a better casting with John Bernthal playing him in the Netflix. I mean, perfect Punisher. But there's some books that take off, but a lot of these Punisher books are cold. Wouldn't you agree? Oh, absolutely. I think, I tell you what, also, Andy is raising the bar here. All you guys from comicbookinvest.com, watch out. These Patreon members are bringing it on the hot and cold list. I think he did a great job with his two picks. Um, I think when we talk about Punisher, I'm going to go back to the Blade conversation. We talked about Cottonmouth being recast. I think that's part of it is, you know, we don't know if we're ever going to see John Barenthal as, Punish, as Punisher again. I do think we saw with J. Jonah Jameson, um, you know, going back and, and casting uh, an actor that had previously played the character. It's not impossible that we won't get a J. A J. Barenthal Punisher, but it's going to be some time before we see Punisher. Plus, there's the non-compete clause with Netflix that's going to keep him off the air for a couple of years. So there's a buying window. But it's important to note that Andy is a diehard Punisher fanatic. He has a great Punisher collection. So he has the best attitude with this, which is, you know, I'm not going to complain about this t cold time period. I'm going to use it to my advantage. If you're a Punisher fan, I'm a Punisher fan. Now's a great time to pick up some of these keys, some of these high-grade books. You saw Andy with his 9.8s there. And let me tell you something, Andy's got some 9.9s in there, too. And now is the time to go ahead and grab these books because they're definitely under market value. And the thing is, we still haven't seen a proper MCU Punisher. It seems crazy to say that because we've seen multiple Punisher movies and multiple Punisher actors. At this point, there's been three predominant actors playing Punisher on the big and small screen. I did but we love still the Thomas have... Jane movie, though. And I did, too. But it, it, everything that's not part of this current MCU just doesn't stack up the same way. And then the reaction in the secondary market isn't the same. Um, and I think if, if the Punisher shows up in, I'll just throw this out, let's say Avengers Secret War, something of that nature, um, you will see an explosion. And I, and I think there's so many books out there of the Punisher that are just undervalued. And like you said, you get the first appearance that's always a wall book at every convention, at almost every major booth, you'll see that book on the wall. But, you know, whether it's Punisher number one from the miniseries, Punisher number one from the ongoing series, Punisher War Zone, um, there's so many books out there that are getting overlooked. And one book I'll bring up right now, that Punisher number 50, which features a preview of Punisher 2099. As we know, in November, we're getting back with 2099. That was another San Diego Comic-Con announcement that Marvel's bringing back that 2099 program. And that could be a book that heats up. But either way, all of these books right now are in a lull. And they a lot of them have potential to get back popular again. Punisher is a character who resonated with so many of us who were comic fans from the 80s and 90s. And I think that you know so many characters have been you know, taken elements of the Punisher, whether it's, you know, Deadpool or, you know, any of these characters where you see this kind of homicidal approach to being a superhero, that all comes from the Punisher. He was the OG of that. And I think that there is a place for that in the MCU, and I cannot wait till we get there. In the meantime, now is the time to grab those books, grab those keys, Grab those high grades, those rare high grades. Grab those late issues that have extremely low print runs. And grab those variants, which are just dirt cheap below ratio for so many awesome Punisher variants. Not comic book, but they just they did just announce a new Marvel Legends action figure that looks freaking sweet. So Yes. Looking forward to that. And I will say probably one of my favorite Punisher covers is that Punisher number one, Jerome Pena variant. The, oh, the, yeah. Venice Beach type with the, the graffiti, the beach wall behind him. I, I freaking love that cover. Still don't own a copy, but so hopefully it, stay, it does stay cold, but that's one that usually doesn't drip, drop in price that much. At least not to my price point to buy it, unless I'm really wanting it. Which that, I run had, that run had a few 
Yeah. A few Punisher variants that were impressive. The white cover where he's shooting off the page and then the right. bullets coming back behind him. And there's a there's a few that are just really stellar from that run. Yeah. So again, thanks, Comic Man Andy. Great cool pick. Really hope you hope you get warm there. I see you got your nice nice little hat, but I think he did a stellar job with his hot and cold pick. He was nervous about it. I think he knocked it out of the park. So thank you. Thank you for, for putting it out there. And again, really appreciate your support on the Patreon. So with that being said, that kind of brings us to what we have as the hot and cold list this week. What do you think of the list, Jack? Overall, a great list. Um, there's definitely things I could name maybe that didn't make the list. But that's only indicative of what's going on right now. There's just so much hot right now. So you see those Hall H announcements on there. Um, you see, you know, that indie flavor from Andy from the Indie Spotlight series. You know, I could throw out there, Turtles are still hot. We're still seeing sales going with those. But, you know, this is a great list. This is a, a list full of um, a lot of spec books that have boomed and made some speculators some money within the last week. Right, and we'll continue to for the foreseeable couple couple weeks, and then again, like we said, with with Disney twenty three coming coming next month in August, I'm sure there's going to be some more news that's going to affect this list as well. Yeah, absolutely. So there's a hot and cold list for you guys. As always, that list is exclusive to the premiere of this video before it hits any other form of social media. One important announcement: that tomorrow we're normally live at nine o'clock. We will have the Bolo Show, but it will also be a premiere just like this video normally is. I am actually going on vacation. I'm going up with the family to Hershey Park. So unfortunately, won't be able to be live, but we will have the video premiering in the normal time slot. Right, Jack? Right, right. Yeah, so while Brian's headed up to Hershey Park, I will be in the chat um, communicating with you guys. So definitely uh, hope that we see you guys there. Hope, hope that you guys are there for the live premiere. And again, if you missed the live premiere, we're going to have that replay up. We're going to have the uh, po podcast audio version up. So a lot of great ways for you to consume the Bolo show. Um, so definitely be on the lookout for that. Um, also want to say and take this moment to kind of shout out our Patreon members and kind of put a plug in for the Patreon. You're seeing our Patreon members show up on the channel um, you know, it's another great avenue. If you haven't joined our Patreon, a lot of great comic discussion, a lot of great bolos being shared. It's a great community. Brian and I both say very reminiscent of the early days of CBSI before the group grew to a level where you couldn't have those kind of one-on-one -on -one interactions as often. A lot of that going on in the Discord chat of our uh, Patreon group. So definitely want to let you know to check that out. Simple Ones Comics Patreon um link is in the description and uh, yeah you know another great week another great list and uh we're looking forward to coming back tomorrow with that uh uh bolo show live or actually not live this week i also want to take the time to thank all the other contributors that provide hot and cold picks week in and week out do a fantastic job with it so kudos to you guys make sure you're checking out their articles over at comicbookinvest.com Fantastic articles. There's a lot of great information in those. So that's comicbookinvest.com. Make sure you guys check them out. So with that being said, guys, we will check you out during the premiere, 9 p.m. Eastern tomorrow, CBSI Bolo Show, recapping the releases of the week. This is Brian and Jack saying goodnight.